Oh, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for our second edition of Tune In Tuesdays with the Long Island Auburn. Um, we're really, really excited about the positive response and the interest in participating in today's session. Um, I know that Erica has muted most participants as they are entering, but I'm going to ask you if you are not currently muted, please mute yourself at this time. For those of you who we haven't met, hi, I'm Kelly Cordero, resource specialist from Long Island Auburn. Hello everyone, I'm Erica Flores. I'm also a resource specialist at the Auburn. So we will be co-hosting today's session on scaffolding for L's in the digital classroom. And um, if you haven't already, we invite you to visit our website, join our listserv, please follow us on Twitter as well, where we try to share any resources and materials that we come across that we think would be helpful to you. Um, we actually have with us today all of our Auburn team. So during this time, and really always, we are always here for you. And um, if you need us, if we can support you in any way, please reach out to us via email. All of our contact information can be found there. We also have a special guest today, Suzanne Pena, an expert on bilingual education in the transitional bilingual and dual language classrooms is here with us today. So feel free to ask her any questions in the chat um, as they relate to dual language and transitional bilingual. Hi everyone. Hi, Suzanne. Thank you so much for joining us from Florida. Yes, welcome, Suzanne. Um, so again, if you haven't already, I'm going to ask that you please mute yourself and simply use the chat feature or the raise your hand feature on Zoom when you wish to contribute. We will be going over all of the participation options briefly, um, but right now, uh, Erica is just going to introduce some other information for us today. Okay, so um, some of you may have seen the Powtoon on uh, scaffolding for elves in the digital classroom. It was shared on Twitter and it's on our website. This will be the basis for our discussion today. And we're gonna weave that through as we expand on some of the scaffolding tools that are discussed. Um, we would like to start by going over some of the Zoom features that maybe you're not familiar with, but we will be using um, in today's presentation. So we want you to know that all of the partition participation today will be done using the Zoom tools. So the first tool we want to talk about um, is the raise your hand feature. So if you click on the uh, participation icon, that's probably at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then you look at the bottom left of the pop-up box that probably comes up to your right. Um, you will see a hand icon and that is the raise your hand feature. So if everyone can just uh, click on that hand so that we know that you found the feature. Mm -hmm. Great, and I see a lot of hands are being raised. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna lower your hands right now, but I'm glad to see that you were able to find that. Um, and successfully raise your hand. In that same participants menu, there are also other response options such as yes, no, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, if we could all just go back into that menu now and give us a thumbs up, just to show that you are finding that and able to use that. Great, I see the response is changing to thumbs up for some of our participants. Thank you. And of course, we will also be using the uh, chat feature on Zoom today. The chat box is on the bottom of your screen. And this is where you can respond to any of the interactive portions of today's presentation, as well as ask questions. And um, it's also a great place if you have specific questions regarding bilingual instruction you can address those questions to Suzanne in the chat. Um, last item that we'll be using is the polling option on Zoom. In some cases during the presentation, you might be asked to respond to the polls within the chat. So we will specify how we want you to respond. 
but we may indicate in some places that we want you to actually respond to the poll. So we just want to make sure that everybody is familiar with this feature as well. So I'm going to launch a practice poll right now. Can everyone see the practice poll? We can. Okay, so the question is, have you ever used the polling feature in Zoom? It's a multiple choice question. Your first choice is yes, I am a polling pro. And your other choice is nope, not yet, haven't polled. So I see some activity going on there. And I do see some people are saying they don't see the poll, um, but I think the majority of people do because I have, we have like 53 responses. So to those who don't see it, we're sorry. Um, I'm going to now share with you. You can see the results of this poll. And as you can see from our participants who responded, we have 22% saying that they are polling pros, good for you. And 80% of our respondents have not used the polling feature yet, but look, they successfully practiced today, so that's good to see. I just wanna point out that um, we will have the chat open during our entire presentation today. If time permits, we may have the opportunity to address some of these questions or comments during our session. But if not, we will be sure to follow up with additional guidance after today's session has ended. Um, so we have successfully used the poll. I'm going to hand it back over to Erica. Okay, so um, all of these features are available on the app version for your smartphone or tablet. Um, and at this time, I do want to welcome everyone to sign into the chat using your first and last name so that we can confirm attendance and also for CTLE credits. So um, just write your first and last name in the chat and that would be helpful. Thank you so much. I see that's currently happening. Um, all right, so I am going to get started. I'm going to leave that screen and I'm opening another screen here. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Powtoons, uh, it is a free website um, in which you can create animated presentations. So we're going to be viewing this, val this Powtoon that I created um, through Edpuzzle. Now again, if you're not familiar, Edpuzzle is another free resource um, in which you can embed questions and discussion points and even voiceovers to scaffold or assess the students as they view a video. So this creates the opportunity for structured engagement during a shared or even an independent viewing. Another great feature of, of Edpuzzle is uh, closed captioning, which you may choose to activate for those students who you feel would benefit from having the text visible while they're viewing a video. Um, Eric and I chose this today because we wanted to be able to model a few different tools, but also to facilitate our, our discussion during today's presentation. Edpuzzle also allows you to crop videos to just focus on specific segments uh, that are most meaningful for instruction. So this really allows you to be intentional with your selection and to not overwhelm students with uh, videos that are overly lengthy. All right, so um, again, we're watching this Powtoon, but we're using Edpuzzle. So what you're seeing is Edpuzzle from the teacher end. It might look slightly different for our students. Hi everyone, this is Erica Flores, a resource specialist at the Long Island Arbor with some helpful tips on how to scaffold for ELS in the digital classroom. In order to develop, a common understanding, I wanted to highlight that scaffolds are temporary supports that a teacher provides to a student that enables a student to perform a task he or she would not be able to perform alone. Considering we are all diving into remote learning, we should be aware that our students will need appropriately scaffolded tools and materials. The idea of digital learning can be overwhelming and maybe even scary for some. However, teachers should continue routines that are already in place. The same differentiation and scaffolds that you are familiar with also apply to the digital classroom. Each and every tool will still require some kind of scaffold. It's okay, so this is our first embedded open-ended question. 
um, and it's going to pop up on your screen uh, through the polling feature in just a second. Okay, and so I think most of us should be seeing this now. Okay, so our question here is, how can we adapt classroom routines to facilitate digital learning? Now we're asking for this question that you please respond in the chat. If you have um, something specific that you'd really like to share at this point, you can also raise your hand to share it. But we're really looking for your input in the chat. Again, we will be um, sharing all of this information, making all of this available to you after today's session. So it's an opportunity for us to really build each other's capacity and we want to hear from you how you're making this transition to support your students in the digital classroom. So I see that there are responses coming in the chat. You may have noticed that while we sent out the poll, we didn't have you respond in this case using the poll feature because the question was open-ended. And um, we do, however, want to point out uh, a benefit of using the poll feature is the ability to both hear and see the question being posed by the teacher. And you can also adjust the Zoom setting if you're using polling in Zoom to either have your poll responses when students are responding. It can either be anonymous or it, it can reflect the participants' names. So there may be instances where either of those options are more beneficial to you. After responding to our poll, our first poll question, Take a look in the chat and see how your colleagues are responding. Again, as I said earlier, this is a great opportunity for us to build each other's capacity and to establish our own professional learning network. As we mentioned earlier, we will try to field some questions during today's session, but if we don't get to them simply because of the size of the group and our time constraints, we will be following up after today's presentation. And again, if time allows, we'll open up a Q&A at the end of the session. So let's just take a look at some of the responses in the chat. Heather, I'm going to ask you, is there anything in particular that you would like to highlight from the responses in the chat? Well, I have to tell you, we have a lot of very skilled uh, tech people in the room. Uh, we have great suggestions on using a variety thing of things. You know, um, I think a lot of people are reading A to Z and Raz Kids are very popular. Um, people are using Schoology, Google Classroom. Um, so I see Boardmaker. Uh, I was thinking about Storyboard that. Um, so we have a lot of great suggestions. Great. That's wonderful to hear. Um, it's exciting that so many different tools are being used during this time. Suzanne, um, is there anything that you can comment on or any considerations for the bilingual digital classroom? So it's very simple. I, I believe that in, you know, we've all been uh, drawn to uh, doing digital classroom, you know, in a very short span. So I think less is more. So if we think of something very simple that we um, could, could integrate into, into our digital classroom, it's just putting the closed captions in the, the target language as well. Remember in a bilingual classroom, whether it's a transitional bilingual classroom or, or dual language classroom, we have to make sure that we're doing what we always do in our normal classroom setting, we also do it in the digital classroom. So a great way would be just to put the closed captions in if it's Spanish um, or if it's Urdu, whatever the case may be, that we do that as well. I saw that some people put also audio, that they're doing PowerPoints with audio. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's a great way. If you have a dual language classroom or transitional bilingual classroom, hey, put the audio as well in, um, in the target language. Um, because that is a great tool for um, all our multilingual learners. Thank you. That's a great point, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we're going to jump back to our how tune. Feel free to continue the discussion in the chat. Um, again, I want to point out that as a teacher, I have the ability to skip a question, but students do not have that feature. Um, but they do have the opportunity to rewatch any portion of the video, which is great feature for L's and Mel's, um, as we know that they benefit from repetition. So we are going to continue now. 
It's important that while we begin this transition to remote learning, that we consider our ALS, their proficiency levels in English, as well as their comfort levels with the tech tools that are implemented. And this is assuming, of course, that they have the necessary technology at home in order to participate in all the distance learning that has been planned for them. Acquiring this information may require you to reach out to the families of your students, which is a great practice to put in place at this time. Okay, so um, here we are at our next poll. Um, and the question reads, sorry, what Kelsey. level of participation are you seeing in your digital classroom? Okay, so so here one can take a second and uh, respond by clicking on one of the answer choices on the poll itself. Kelly, I think you might have to um, relaunch. Launch. Yep. I will relaunch. Nope, still nothing. So at this point, um, if you can just type it in the chat. What level of participation are you seeing in your digital classroom? Is it visible now? It is. I see a lot of responses coming in on the poll. Okay, so um, we're, seeing, we're seeing the responses and uh, Kelly just closed the poll and is sharing the results. So uh, based on your responses, we do have a follow-up question for you, for those of you who have indicated less than 100% that is. So here comes the follow-up question. Is it visible? It is. Okay, great. So the question is, have you reached out to your students who have not engaged in the digital classroom? And we have different options for you. Yes, using tools like Remind 101 or Talking Points. Yes, by phone. Yes, via our digital classroom platform. And no, not yet. Um, okay, just by the numbers, it looks like many of you have already responded. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share the results of this poll now. So we are showing that 56% of our respondents have reached out through Remind and Talking Points. Um, we have 39 people are responding that they have contacted students by phone. 17 have reached out through their digital classroom platform. And I'm happy to see that zero are reporting that they have not reached out yet. Um, but re the reason why we bring this up is that we just want you to think for a moment about why monitoring student engagement is really so critical at this time. So of course, aside from our academic concerns, we must also consider the social emotional experiences and well-being of all of our students. So really for us, a lack of participation in our online settings may be a red flag that students are really struggling with feelings of isolation or perhaps just processing the current situation and our new learning environment. So making efforts to contact all students, but especially those who are not currently engaging in our digital classrooms is really a very critical action at this time. You might even uh, consider incorporating uh, questioning tactics that encourage reflection and providing opportunities for students to express their feelings. I think typically if you ask a question like, are you okay? Uh, the response will be yes. But if we phrase our questions uh, carefully, we may be able to elicit a deeper reflection and uh, response to identify those students who are in need of additional supports and resources. Um, for example, our younger children may be asked to describe their experience at home um, by selecting a, an image or something that reflects how they're feeling. Um, and my experience with 
secondary students is that they're really, they're willing to share uh, their feelings and really need only to be asked. Um, so Suzanne, what are your thoughts uh, about communication during this time? So it is very important, and especially since uh, this situation is changing every day. You know, one day we have this, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of Florida. Um, as of yesterday, we thought schools were going to be open April 15th. Um, yet last night they made an announcement, schools are closed till May 1st. So this is a situation that's always changing. And because of that, we need to be even more diligent about knowing what are the circumstances that are preventing our students from um, being engaged because it, this might be the, the classroom that they have until the foreseeable future, right? So one way that we can always make sure that we um, kind of alleviate or mitigate some of those uh, issues that they might have is making sure that I saw somebody that put maybe the internet, right? Having access to internet might be an mm -hmm. issue, right? Maybe putting on the school's website or things like that, how they can get free, um, free internet. That is a great way um, for letting uh, families know that there's internet available, right? That's one way. Also, another thing is they might, the parents might not be tech savvy. Um, we as educators are having difficulty navigating this terrain, right? So imagine also parents that that might be even just working from home <laughs> and on top of that also dealing with, you know, now being to have to be educators as well at home. So making videos in both languages, especially in the transitional bilingual classrooms and in our dual language classrooms, it is important that we keep that um, by literacy, bilingualism aspect of everything. So making videos that show parents how to use Zoom, how to use, um, how to go, go on to Google Classroom, how to navigate Google Classroom or Seesaw or either or, those are very good. And you don't have to take on that entire responsibility. You can share it amongst uh, the, the staff in the school. So talk to your principal, maybe email them and let them know, hey, and we'll take turns on doing this. So those are great ways and very simple, very fast ways that you can um, continue by literacy and bilingualism and also help your parents and your students. Great. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Before we go back to the video, I see Diana Bata has her hand raised. Diana, is there something, um, if you unmute yourself, is there something that you wanted to share re related to that thought? No, I probably hit the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That's I'm, fine too. That's I'm fine just too. learning all of this stuff. So. That's great. That's exactly what we're hoping to, to uh, provide an opportunity to just play around with some of these tools that then you can turn around and, and you know, support your students using these tools. So I see that Melody's that hand just went up though. So let's see okay. if this is an actual, you know, a, a sure. question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Melody. Melody, let yes, me unmute Melody. you. Okay, there. Nice to meet you too. Okay, um, there we go. I just wanted to comment on what Paris had just said about the free Wi-Fi wi services because I had a family trying to access that, but because they don't have a social security number or an ITIN number, they weren't able to get it. So, okay. I mean, fortunately in Babylon Village, there's actually free Wi-Fi. It's very skippy and bad, but I just figured I'd, I'd let the community know that yeah, it's free Wi-Fi, but we still need your name and address and a social security number for credit in case you continue with us later on for some reason that was like... Well, well Melody, um, great point. So uh, another way that we can also mitigate that is on cell phones, right? So even with our smartphones, many of the parents that do have a smartphone, you can make it into a hotspot, okay? Yeah. Yes, so, that's what I suggested. Yeah, so I just, that's, I, I that's let you guys a great know. way. That's a great way. So thank you for pointing that out. So that's a, actually a great way, but actually many parents might not know how to make their cell phone into a hotspot. So making a little video, honestly, it doesn't have to be Hollywood quality here. Making a very, because very, I'll be the first one. My, my videos are not Hollywood quality, but they're just informational. They're just there to inform and just mm -hmm. making it in both languages and explaining, hey, this is the button that you press and you know, and the most popular devices, this is how you do it, blah, 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 and that you can use your cell phone as a hotspot device. So that's a way um, that we can mitigate the situation. Thank you so much, Melody, for sharing. Thank you. 
All right, so we're going back in. And again, I'm going to skip only because I'm the teacher. I want to highlight this resource created by the folks over at Support Ed. You may have already noticed that you are actively using these scaffolds in the classroom. It's important to continue to do so as you transition into distance learning. Rather than share another list of tools that you and your students would need to learn, I want to highlight how to make distance learning accessible for our L population. Keep in mind that there is no single magic tool that will make content comprehensible for our Ls. Instead, you should continue to choose quality resources and adapt them to the needs of your students. Okay, so um, our next question is being shared with you right now via the polling tool. And the question is, what are the tools that work for you and your students? Now, um, as you can see, we have added some popular tools which you may or may not be using. So um, you can either choose one of those, but we don't want you to feel limited to those responses. That's why we've also included the option of other. And if you indicate other, please share in the chat what you are using. We want to um, hear about all the different tools that you're using at this time. I'm also going to share with you um, a link in the chat. It didn't come through just yet, Kelly. Okay. But what Kelly is um, attempting to share in the chat is um, this the scaffolding resource from Support Ed, uh, which is what you see on the Powtoon there. Um, it's a great resource, both in the class, the traditional classroom and in the um, digital classroom as well. Um, so we're going to have to squint, if you can, <laughs> to see the scaffolds that are on the Powtoon screen um, and do so in order to answer our following question. Are you able to share that, Kelly? Did that go through in the chat? Um, Nope, not yet. Okay. All right, so um, the next poll question does relate to those scaffolds. Do you see it now in the chat? It's there. It should be the link. Okay. Yes, thank you. Sorry. That's okay. All right, so the following question we have for you, um, once you take a peek at those scaffolds, uh, consider how do these scaffolds transfer to the digital classroom? How do these scaffolds uh, provided by Support Ed there, how do they transfer into the digital classroom? That is our next poll, if you can put that out, Kelly. Sure. And while you're thinking or typing, um, I want to remind everyone that this, again, like Suzanne said, this is probably not the best time to introduce new tools. Um, you want to continue to use the tools that you and your students are familiar with. If this is all new, be intentional with those selections. You don't want to overwhelm yourself or the students with too many tools that may be too complex to master outside of the traditional classroom. All right, so. Waiting to see if we get a few more responses in the chat. How do the scaffolds transfer to the digital classroom? I see someone saying uh, to simplify mainstream materials that match the ability level of the students. I like that because, um, you know, we st we're still using quality tools, right? And we're just um, 
doing what we know our students who are who are in our classroom right now need right so i think that's a great response um someone said graphic organizer graphic organizers and google drawings i love google drawings and i love graphic organizers so you just put two of my favorites together All right, so we are going to return to the video. Visuals in the digital classroom extend beyond images or videos to support the language on your slides or handouts. Remember that our students are learning language through nonverbal cues as well. So utilize opportunities to engage with students through synchronous and asynchronous videos. So at this point, we just want to offer some reminders. Um, many of which you may already, you know, may already be at the forefront of your mind. But of course, we need to always consider our proficiency levels because they can help us determine the amount of time that we should be dedicating to synchronous versus asynchronous engagement. Um, you know, when we think of our lower proficiency students, they would probably benefit most from synchronous instruction and support, whereas our higher proficiency students um, can operate more independently in asynchronous learning. We should also consider as much as we can whenever the opportunity arises to, to show your face in whatever instruction, whatever tools you're using, make yourself visible. Um, because we know, first of all, just for that social emotional connection, that's such an important thing. But also when we're thinking of the support that it lends, our facial expressions, our um, social cues, our body language really provide a much higher level and degree of comprehensible input for our students. So we want to allow them to benefit from that as much as possible. Now, what about wait time? We all know um, how critical extended wait time is in our traditional classroom discussions. And really it is just as important in our digital classroom. So especially if our students are, are now adding the challenge of navigating a new tool or just um, becoming used to this new learning environment, we need to provide that additional time for them to process, for them to interact and participate and really engage in our digital classrooms. So Zoom has, you know, we're using Zoom today. Zoom has become a go-to resource for many of us, whether in business or in education. It's really become a way for us to conduct our day-to-day -day interactions. And for many of us and our students, this is a new tool. It's a fairly new tool that, um, that we're relying on quite heavily to facilitate our distance learning. So to this end, we wanted to share another resource with you that we have also shared on Twitter. And um, it provides student-friendly directions. And it's also available. So it's student-friendly directions for using Zooms, a lot of different tips. But it's available in English, Spanish, French, Polish, and German. So I'm just going to grab the link to that right now. And I'm going to share that in the chat as well. And you know that really is. goes to what Suzanne was sharing earlier about providing um, those directions and videos for uh, parents as well in in the target language. If you're in those dual language or transitional bilingual classrooms, um, thank you, Kelly. It's in the chat now, so okay. if you are looking for those directions. They are there. Right. Um, all right, and we are going to jump back into our video. You may also consider using screenshots with arrows indicating where to click, videos, modeling an activity, or even a screencast. Technology at home may be very different than at school, requiring additional explicit directions and considerations. Writing frames should be provided to students in order to participate in all activities. These frames should be teacher generated and relevant to the current task. Providing samples allows for students to mimic sophisticated language and better understand expectations. Okay, so here we are taking a, a quick stop just to have another opportunity to learn from one another. So um, feel free to share your own successes or challenges with language frames and how they've transcended into oral language. So please do that in the chat. Um, remember the role of environmental text 
is just as critical in our digital classrooms as it is in the traditional classroom. Uh, perhaps even more so seeing as we are not there to provide that support to our students. So language frames for discussion and oral language practice should be accessible for students at all times. Um, you might want to do this via whatever platform you're currently using. Uh, for example, if you're using Google Classroom, you can share them there prior to a synchronous um, meeting. Um, or if you are using Zoom, for example, um, putting a link to some kind of frame in the chat, just as mm -hmm. Kelly was doing. She was sharing those resources with you via the chat there. Um, so I see some discussion happening in the chat, but Suzanne, um, what did you want to add to that? Well, actually, again, and I, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but when it comes to dual language and bilingual classrooms, we have to make sure that what we're doing for English, we do it for the target language. And we don't forget that just because we're doing digital classrooms doesn't mean that we're not going to do that. Um, so one way to do this in a, I guess, easier way, for lack of a better word, is making sure that when you're uh, giving a task um, and where sentence starters might be needed, for example, like a writing task, um, make sure that you predict, you kind of predict your students' answers. You know your students very well, right? You know their levels in either English and the target language. Then make sure that you are adding or having those sentence starters available for them um, as you're also assigning the tasks to them. Because if we forget to do this, then we're just um, basically in terms of the message that we're sending, we're sending just a one language um, is more important than the other. And then we're also, all that great work that we just did, it's kind of by not uh, focusing also on the target language, we're also forgetting about teaching that target language as well. So we have to make sure that we incorporate this in everything that we do. Um, again, less is sometimes more, and especially when it comes to digital classroom, um, we may assign something that is uh, more meaningful and more uh, robust, and it might be shorter and smaller, if that makes any sense. It does. Thank you, Suzanne. I do see a hand raised, so I'm going to unmute uh, Samantha. Hi, Samantha. Hi. So I just wanted to share a really great resource for all ENL teachers. Um, this can also be used by classroom teachers. I know that I taught a PD this past, um, actually we had one more class left, but due to home instruction, we didn't get a chance to finish mm -hmm. it. But um, during this class, we offered teachers an opportunity to use thinking maps. And what was so mm -hmm. great about them was the students were able to, based on their level, uh, use their native language, you were able to implement sentence frames and starters for them. You know, we use that sometimes as their assessment for their learning and it makes their learning visual. So our district is currently moving towards Seesaw and I know our students are going to be working on their informational writing tasks. So one of the things that we're doing as I collaborate with the teachers is for their writing, implementing these thinking maps as their writing assessment. And they're able to, like I said, use their own uh, native language, use pictures, visuals, short words, whatever they're able to do at their point of proficiency with my support, of course. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Samantha. All right, I'm going to lower hand. Um, and Heather, going... Heather, was there anything else from the chat, anything that you wanted to highlight as far as any struggles or any other? Um, comments that were shared? Yeah, I think that everyone is very excited about getting uh, different resources to incorporate into whatever tool they're using. We have people who can't use Zoom and, and are going to be using Google Meet and they want mm -hmm. some ideas around incorporating that or tutorials for the kids. Um, and also uh, some of the sentence frames to have them available by category and and uh, mm -hmm. discipline and mm -hmm. theme, which exists. So I, my, my word to everyone is, um, these are, keep posting these uh, requests and mm -hmm. after, in a few days, we'll be collecting all these resources for you, gathering these yes. things together because they do exist and we'll be sending them out. Yes, Good yes, stuff. thank you so much. That's a great point because this really gives us a springboard to know what, what you need and, and how we can best 
um, provide additional information for you, additional resources, materials, and supports that, that you're asking for. So it's not just you know, an overwhelming abundance of information, but that it's specific to your requests. And so um, I see in the chat, Ziomad is asking about this presentation. It's actually on our website already. Um, so you can go there and find this, uh, the Powtoon, if that's what you're referring to. Um, if you're referring to today's webinar, we will also be providing the link to today's recorded session after, after we complete it. After so uh, <laughs> both, both resources will be available to you on our website. Right. Okay, we are going to continue with our um, final little clip of this video. Graphic organizers should be simple. Use something the students have seen before. Model using familiar content. And consider providing tiered versions where some boxes are pre-populated according to the student's proficiency levels. Reduce the linguistic load by using tools such as Google Translate or Talking Points to utilize the home language. Adapt or chunk text by using Rewordify, New CLA, and ReadWorks. But also keep the rigor and try and do this on your own. Lastly, pre-teach vocabulary, conduct virtual field trips, and include videos to help build background knowledge. Thank you for joining me and reach out with any questions. So we're at the end of the Powtoon within Edpuzzle. You know, this is like inception, just layered um, how we, we share this with you. But just some final short uh, thoughts that we wanted to share on that last segment of the Powtoon. Um, Erica had referred to um, graphic organizers providing those in um, tiered format. So tiering assignments such as that um, can be shared with specific students um, based on, on their proficiency level, based on the level of support that, that you identify them as needing. Um, but some tasks might also lend themselves to incorporating student choice and you may wish to share those tiered materials with all of your students. Um, if you're using videos or virtual field trips, as Erica referred to, please be sure to watch them in their entirety first in order to anticipate, plan for, and provide appropriate scaffolding as needed with, with your students in mind. You know the needs of your students, so you know how they will need to be supported in accessing um, any, of those, any of those items. And now we've come to the end of this week's Tune In Tuesday. We really want to thank you again for participating. We hope that you found this helpful. Again, Erica's original Powtoon is already available on our website. Um, and again, we, we did tweet that as well if you want to find it there. A recording of today's session, as I said earlier, will be available shortly. And Erica and I will also, and really all of our Auburn team, we will be reviewing all the comments and questions that you have contributed to the chat so that we can follow up in providing as much support and as many resources as possible. Um, we do still have some time left if there are any uh, particular questions at this time, if we want to open it up to a brief Q&A. Right, if anyone has a, wants to raise their hand, we can certainly unmute, or you can throw in the chat. Oh, here we go, Samantha's up. Hi, Samantha. Hi, I was just curious if you can show us how to incorporate a poll into a Zoom session. Um, yes and no. So, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I can't show you on this screen because it has to be done prior to the session. So it's in your settings when you're creating um, the meeting, you would do that in from there. But um, what we can do, even though we can't demonstrate it for you now, we can probably put together a little step-by-step -step of, because we were really experimenting with all of these features too in the past couple of weeks. So we can perhaps put together a little step-by-step -step of how we embedded it, um, that would be if, awesome. if that would be helpful. Samantha, yeah, if you could just type that in the chat so that it reminds myself and Kelly yes. to create that, yeah. that would be great. Um, I'm going to mute you and I see uh, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Um, I'm having a difficult time with technology. I know to, I should be incorporating graphic organizers. I'm using Google Classroom, but I don't mm -hmm. know how to get them in there. All right, so I think one of our participants actually brought up uh, Google Drawings. Um, yeah, I heard her say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a great tool to create um, graphic organizers because you can just put 
you know, a whole bunch of different shapes in there to kind of create ex exactly what you need for your students. And once that's created into your drive, you're able to upload it. It, it plays, obviously it plays uh, very nicely with Google Classroom seeing it's all part of the same suite. Um, so, I mean, I would recommend going that route and then uploading. How do you get, just put in googledrawings.com? Um, Google Drawings, no, it's in the Google Suite. So you, it's oh, just one of, yeah, it's like uh, Google Drive, Google Docs, and Google Drawings is, is automatically in there as well. Okay, I'll try it. All right, good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Anybody else, any questions? Oh, Heather's just making a comment that I just have to shout out. HyperDocs rock. Yes, they do. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Any other, if you'd like to raise your hand, if there's anything specific that you'd like us to try to address at this time? All, all right, right, I'm all quiet. Um, I want to thank Suzanne so much for uh, joining us today. Yes, thank and you, Suzanne. Us, um, you know, another lens looking at those bilingual and dual language classrooms. Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and everyone, please, you know, visit our website frequently for updates. Follow us on Twitter and be well. Yes, be well, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And look out for next week's Tune In Tuesdays with the Long Island Arbor. Thank you all. Be well. Thank you.